My name is Josh Bernstein, and I'm a Brooklyn-based beer journalist. And that is an incredibly weird profession to even talk about at this moment, too, because 15, 20 years ago, I could not even think about the fact that I would actually have this career. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, oh my gosh, look at that. Look, and there's a picture. So I'm a beer journalist. What is that? You know, 15 years ago, there wasn't really anything like beer journalism in America. It was still very embryonic. We had just started really coming out of these doldrums of this era where everybody just drank light lager. If you drank beer, it wasn't what kind of beer. It was just beer. You were kind of wedded to one brand from the day you started drinking to the day you died. And that's the way things have been going on for decades and decades and decades. But around the early 2000s, I really started seeing things start changing in American society. And around then, I moved to New York kind of randomly. I ended up on this road trip that went awry. I got dropped off in Montana. Somebody had a free bedroom in Astoria, Queens. I was like, sure, that sounds great. And as a 22-year-old in New York City, I worked a series of really regrettable, terrible temp jobs. And then beyond that as well, I did what any other 22-year-old would do in a big city, and that's drink. And so I went out to all the dive bars, checked things out too, and after a while, I started writing about these bars for places like uh, New York Magazine, Time Out New York, and so on. And you don't go to the bar and drink the same thing with all these options that are available right there. And so what I started doing is trying all these different beers, and I was just really blown away by the variety and scope of flavor that was available out there, too. I mean, what was just a kind of a monoculture was really blossoming. You know, every single day I would find new beers. You'd find beers with more hops. You'd find bitters, citrus, stouts, chocolatey. Anything you'd think of, things were popping out there. And so as a journalist, I really started feeling very passionately about who are these people behind it? Because you see these beers in your hand and, you know, you think, oh, that's the end of the story right there, too. Well, I really wanted to find out with beer is what's the beginning of the story? Why do these people want to start these breweries? If you think about it, most of American beer is dominated by large companies like Anheuser-Busch, Miller Coors, and so on. But a lot of these smaller breweries, people are kind of doing this David versus Goliath thing. They really wanted to put all of their hopes out there just for the fact of giving people another different beer to try. And so to me, as a writer, that really compelled me to seek out these people. And, you know, one story led to another story to another story. And, I, you know, at, next thing I know, I mean, it was like five years later, and I'm writing about beer pretty much full time. And so, and that kind of led to me writing books on beer, which is crazy because I never thought that would happen. But the first one was Brood Awakening, story about the American craft beer revolution, a complete beer course, which gave people the tools and knowledge to understand styles. And then we watched IPAs take over America and the world, and then Homebrew World, because I think what's been happening in America was we've got a great minor league team of homebrewers who are brewing beer in their homes, apartments, backyards, wherever. And they're really the ones that really change the way that we drink and think. And so, but that's happening around the world from, you know, Japan to Argentina and so on. So homebrewers everywhere else are doing the same things that we did and really reinvent their cultures from the inside out. So, you know, so like I said before, beer's a finished story. I really seek the beginning of what beer is. So I profile everyone from brewers to bartenders, the farmers that are growing all of the hops. And then I really had this idea that I want to translate the beer world to a much broader audience because sometimes beer can be a little bit too geeky. You can walk into a beer store and see 10,000 things on the shelf and they all look exactly alike and it's really hard. And, you know, you get a little paralyzed with choice. So my job for me is to really take these ideas, translate them to the broader audience and give people the tools and knowledge to understand. And then, you know, beer at its core really is about agriculture. So for me, it's important to talk about you know, climate change is real. It really does impact what happens to brewers, too, that beer is an agricultural crop. It beer is made with hops, malt, water, yeast, and these agricultural products change every year, too. So the grains you get this year are not going to be the grains you get next year. So to me, it's endlessly fascinating. And then the other thing, too, is I spot trends. And so, you know, the joke is in journalism, if you can find three of anything, you have found a trend. And so what actually is a trend, and that's a good question. I mean, you see things that are sort of, they can be flash in the pan, you see people dump fried chicken into a beer, and then someone dumps like a pig's head into a beer, you're like, is that a trend or is that a gimmick? And so for me, I really have to sit there and analyze what's important, 
What's something that's not just to get headlines? What's something that's really going to go out there and really sort of change the industry that we're in? And so what's happening right now is we have more than 6,000 breweries in America. And what ends up happening with that, too, is there's a lot of people. I think, I think, I think the majority of Americans live within 10 miles of a brewery. And that's crazy. So any city in America, you can pretty much get in a car, drive 10, 15 minutes, and find a brewery. That sort of density just it wasn't even possible 10 years ago. And so, but the other challenge is with all of these people, there's a lot more heightened competition. And so what makes your one IPA different from another IPA? And the question is not an awful lot sometimes. And so what ends up really happening is I feel people are trying to find new ways to stand out. And so right now we're in a very sort of like hyper accelerated trend culture that beer styles really were able to sort of develop over the course of you know, decades and centuries. It was all about agricultural availability, the talent that was in your hometown, your water source, what local people wanted to drink. And nowadays, with sort of international travel and the internet, everything has really been flattened. People can read about one trend online, hop on the plane, and then the next day they can actually have these beer styles in their hand. And it's just so fascinating that nothing is really native or indigenous anymore, too, that things have really been uprooted from region, and we're all sort of in this sort of a pursuit of flavor. And so right now what we see happening with sort of uh, this is there's just been this mad dash creative cycle that's happening right now. And these are a few of the things that I'm looking at that are happening. So you see Brute IPA. So it's not just enough to dump a bunch of hops in a beer, create something bitter or hazy and call it an IPA. Now people are looking to uh, champagne for inspiration and making IPAs are incredibly dry that mimic champagne effervescence, something that could be sued for sparkling occasions, or milkshake IPAs, which is something where people are dumping lactose, which is milk sugar, into the beer and creating these sort of very creamy dream school like drinks. And the question is, is it beer? And I don't know, I, I go back to the idea that if it makes you happy, you should go for it. I mean, and that's really it. I mean, there's not anyone, I'm not here to tell anybody that what they're brewing is heresy. I think we're kind of beyond that right now, but I think all these brewers are sort of in the pursuit of something that's nuanced, that's something that's flavorful, something that really speaks to them. And Norwegian farmhouse yeast, that's this crazy wooden ring which old Norwegian brewers dip in dip in beer and get all the yeasts out, and it creates these like crazy tropical flavors. So we're investigating all these sort of wild farmhouse traditions around the world too. And for example, that one, uh, that Norwegian farmhouse traditions existed only in very small rural communities, but now you're seeing American brewers are really sort of like smitten by the idea and the potential of these European traditions to create something new, which kind of brings us to the point that we're here for today for. So breweries are really looking to uh, sake for inspiration at this moment, too. That brewers have really always been not shy about crossing disciplines as well. They've looked to wine, and they will uh, blend beer with, like, red wine grapes and age it in wine barrels, or they'll look to uh, beer, or look to bourbon, and they'll age big stouts in bourbon barrels and creating something new and almost taking these um, different disciplines and creating something that's incredibly delicious. And so what's happening a bit now too is I think brewers are really looking to sake for inspiration. And you know, if you think about it at its core, there's really a lot of similarities between the two beverages. Like beer, sake is a fermented beverage. Sake, not a lot in common with wine. Sake has so much more in common with what beer is. And so the big differences are though that sake is derived from rice while beer is made with barley and other grains too. And then the key difference, though, is the way the sort of uh, grains are, uh, the grain sugary potential is unlocked because the yeast needs to get in there and get all the sugar and crunch it all up and turn into delicious, delicious alcohol. And so the way that that happens is with, uh, you know, rice is inoculated with, uh, I'm always going to mangle this pronunciation, but Aspergillus fungus, which is AKA Koji, which has enzymes that convert starches into fermentable sugars, while beer undergoes malting in which sort of the grains are seeped in like warm water, jumps up germination, and open up the uh, grains to allow the sort of sugary potential to flourish. And so in the end, but the end product is the same, that yeast just need a way to sort of activate the uh, sugars to uh, create alcohol. And so what's happening now too is in a really true American fashion, what I really see happening right now is that breweries are looking to create collaborations. One of the biggest ways I see that you can get these ideas out there in the world too is by working directly with people such as, uh, you know, 
if you're a wine producer, you work with a brewer, all of a sudden you create these cross categories that come together and really engage multiple audiences. And so in this case, too, brewers are looking to sort of collaborate with sake producers. And in this sense, too, one of the really ones I like talking about a lot is up in Cambridge, Mass Cambridge, Massachusetts, there's a brewery called Cambridge Brewing Company, which makes sense. And for the last four or five years, they've been partnering with a great sake company called Dovetail. And so the way they go about this, too, is so they will brew sort of like a, uh, they'll create a sake, then they'll brew a really strong, a strong base beer, the wort, which is sort of the unfermented sugar-rich broth. And then they'll combine them together and add sake yeast and just allow these two things to go together and go to town. And what it does in the best possible sense is it really creates this sort of, um, you know, this beverage that really, you can't put it in either category. It's something that's both warming, warming, sustaining, but also has unmistakable notes of sort of the grains, but also this sort of, uh, this rice characteristic as well. And it's just something I think that when you drink something like that, it makes you think really about the possibilities of what beer can be. Because I think right now there's, there, there really is an endless potential to what beer can be. Beer can be whatever you dream of. And I think this too, in such an interesting way, it not only is sort of like crossing these two worlds together, but it's also really taking this idea of what rice can be in beer. For the longest time, there's been a lot of sort of, um, there was this big pushback. There's an industry group called the Brewers Association. And about five or six years ago, they said beer should only have grains, you know, should only have grains that are like barley, should only have water, yeast, and hops. You shouldn't have corn and rice in there. Those aren't real ingredients for beer. And there was this huge pushback because corn and rice have really important roles in beer. So the corn adds a little bit of sweetness, helps the sort of head on your beer stick around. Rice really lightens up a body, creates crispness, but there is sort of this like terrible stigma against rice for a number of years in beer. And so a lot of people are like, I would never ever brew beer with rice. And it's like, why? Because one person told you so. But if you think back to traditionally in American society, the reason that we used a lot of these sort of ingredients like rice and corn was because when, we, when Americans started brewing beer hundreds of years ago, the barley that we had was a lot harsher. And so we need ingredients such as sort of uh, rice and corn to, be, you know, to make it more palatable to the taste buds. So rice has always had a very, so rice and corn have always had very historic roles in American society and they just underwent this sort of like smear campaign for a number of years. So what's happening now is rice is something that I think brewers are really embracing again and sake is a really interest by partnering with sake producers it's a really interesting way to go about you know bringing these two things together and so here in new york city we're seeing these trends sort of hit very on the local level too um brooklyn curra has anyone been there yet or a few hands out there too well brooklyn curra is a sake producer in sunset park and they're doing really amazing fun stuff and i mean a terrific tap room, a great place to go hang out at. And right down the road, about 10 blocks away, you're going to find Five Burrows Brewing Company, which is one of New York City's newer brewers, and have like a little slight divergent path. The reason that we're seeing all these breweries in New York City, because New York City breweries have really only taken off in the last five years was because like anything else in life, like the government let them do it and made it much easier. So until about five years ago in New York City, you couldn't sell pints directly out of your tap room. And you know, if you're going to sell anything, the most profitable way to actually make money on it is by selling these beers directly to consumers in your hand. If you sell it to a distributor, the middleman takes a cut, somebody else takes a cut, you get pennies of what you could have gotten. If you sell beer directly, all of a sudden all the money comes back to you. And that's super important in a city like New York where the one thing that kills everybody is rent. And so, and breweries need a ton of square footage. But what changed at the end of 2013, early 2014 was the laws in New York City really allowed us to they allow breweries to sell pints directly out of the tap room. And that's why that really opened the gates to breweries that opened up in our formerly industrial neighborhoods like Gowanus, Long Island City, and Sunset Park, where you're gonna find five boroughs which sits in the steel man former steel manufacturing plant. And so the two breweries got together, so the sake brewery and the brewery got together and they're like, how can we really find a unique way to kind of combine the talents? And so what they did was they went over to uh, Brooklyn Curra, they took the uh, rice, inoculated with koji, and then brought the rice over to uh, Five Burrows Brewing, and they dumped it in the brew kettle too. So you're going to have that sort of like, so rice is going to contribute that sort of like clean crispness too, but then the koji quality is in there as well, like kind of really add this sort of like citrusy, fresh quality. And it's, you know, a lager, which people think of lagers as being boring, but it had this sort of, 
balanced beauty to it, this sort of beguiling note that you couldn't quite figure out. And it was just this like really delicate synthesis of two different strains of brewing together. And I mean, it, it really just shows you the case what, what's possible. And I think, which is what I really love about that too. But you know, American brewers are not always ones to go for tradition. And what, if there's anything that we have done, it's basically take tradition and throw it out the window. So in the beginning, a lot of American beer was inspired by beer from England, inspired by beer from you know, Belgium inspired by beer from elsewhere too. And then, you know, then we took these ideas and kind of cranked it up to 11. And so, you know, if like a little bit of hops is good, a lot of hops will be even better. If a little bit of like bourbon character is fun, why not just like dump even more in? And so what we're seeing now too is a lot of uh, sake breweries are starting up right now. They're taking deep inspiration for beer. And you can look at this as sort of a bastardization, or I look at it as a way that you can really entice people to kind of decontextualize sake. I think sake a lot of times sits in this realm with people that it's nothing but, you know, like a hot drink you should have with cold fish at a restaurant. And it's, it's not like that. There's so many more possibilities. And so I think it gets really pigeonholed. But what these breweries are doing, some of the modern American sake breweries, is taking these ideas and making them sort of approachable to a broader audience. And so one of the you know, more prominent examples I like to utilize is Setting Sun Sake in San Diego. And that was started by a former brewer. And he'd worked all around the San Diego beer scene. And, you know, San Diego is one of America's brewing epicenters, and it's also insanely crowded. San Diego County has, I think, more than 150 breweries right now, and there's a lot of competition for everybody making the same IPA, the same this, the same that. And so one way that people are looking to differentiate themselves is really finding other avenues of fermentation expression. If you're a brewer, you don't just like making beer. It's not like you get stuck in a silo that says that I can only make beer from day in, day out. You know, it's all about the fermentation possibilities of the natural world around you. And so I think what we're seeing here too is, so Josh from Setting Sun went out and he's like, I'm going to make a very modern approach to sake. Is it traditional? No, but he's putting hops in sakes, making sakes inspired by strong German lagers, making them gin botanicals. And I mean, I think part of the pursuit too is really about the pursuit of flavor. And for him, I mean, there's no... When you, when you eliminate the idea of tradition and you open up the doors, and like, like one of the quotes I put up there, his dream is to see all his favorite beer styles iterate through the prism of sake, as well as in reverse. And so it's just this sort of um, cross-pollination of disciplines together and really broadening these, these ideas. And what sake offers for fermentation capabilities is really engaging to a number of breweries as well. So what we're seeing right now as well is breweries that are opening up sake divisions in America, which is something that's you know, not a huge thing, but it's something because you have to get a different license to be able to produce sake. So, but it is in some sense like the beginning of a mirror image of what happened in Japan, where, as I mentioned, until 1994, the laws in Japan, I think it was until 1994 in Japan, you needed to brew something like 20 million liters of beer a year to get a brewing license. And 20 million liters of beer is a, or sorry, 2 million liters of beer a year is a ton of beer. And so a lot of the breweries that start up are just kind of like bootstrapped operations together, and there's no way they could produce beer on an industrial scale. But the law change in 94 really allowed, I think it lowered the limit to, I think, 60,000, or the minimum 60,000 a year, which is a much more manageable number. And so you start seeing a number of uh, sake breweries that started producing beer as well, too. Because if you understand the idea of fermentation, it's not a far leap to take your sort of um, precise fermentation capabilities and applying them to a different medium. So probably the mo most famous one that we have uh, stateside is going to be uh, Kiyuchi Brewery, which started producing uh, been producing sake since 1823, started producing beer under the Hidashino Nest line of beers in 96. And so that's one of the more widely available examples we're going to have stateside. But then as well, Herkimer Brewing in Minneapolis, you saw in 2008, Blake, Herkimer Little Brewery in Minneapolis, he's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make an authentic sake brew pub in Minneapolis, which would probably not be the first place in the world you think of an authentic sake brew pub popping up, but they're doing amazing traditional stuff. You go in there and it's just an amazing transportive experience. And then it's not just something that's happening in the U.S. and Norway. Nonio has been uses Japanese rice and have their own sake uses Japanese rice to produce their own line of sake products too. And they've also done co-fermentations where they're using things such as koji and other sake yeast to produce beers that really sort of defy instant categorization. And even more recently, Chicago's Off Color, which 
really does everything from historical beers to farmhouse inspired whatever as you can dream of they went and got a sake production license i think they have a license number 17 in america so i mean which just goes to show you that this is something that if 6000 brewery plus in america like 17 sake licenses you can see why people may be really interested in exploring this new medium it's basically Beer was a white space 30 years ago, 40 years ago in America. Beer is not really a blank space anymore. I mean, it's filled up, but I think sake for a lot of breweries, what you're seeing now too, is just these new ways. It's a new way to speak the language of fermentation and entice customers. And so what Off Color is doing, instead of taking sort of a very traditional approach, they're using the same wild yeast that they will, wild yeast and souring cultures. And after they inoculate the rice with koji, they'll apply their own beer cultures to these uh, to the fermentations and create something that just, it speaks to both the beer drinker, the intrepid sake consumer, it's served in the tap room where they can be able to hand sell it and discuss the processes. And it's just this sort of like really, really fascinating evolution of what, of what beer can be and how beer relates to other beverages too. And, uh, you know, so what this really means right now too is the future is pretty wide open when it comes to it as well. As I mentioned, America's brewing traditions are pretty much, you know, we lost them all. I mean, after Prohibition, we basically took our brewing traditions and tossed them down the drain. And then only in the last 30 years have we really had the wherewithal and the ability to kind of rewrite our new traditions. And so basically, American brewers really look at the world as sort of... um endless possibility and inspiration can be found from anywhere. So what we're seeing too is, even if not quite as explicitly as opening up a sake brewery, that you see a lot of breweries are utilizing sort of um, sake techniques and traditions and trends and able to really find something so water extra dry that was inspired as a great Saison brew with rice and was supposed to mimic sake as like, you know, subtle characteristics and drinkability, 3.8%, beautiful beer that you can have whenever and wherever. Um, over in England, Wild Beer Company is like really is focusing on the umami aspects of Japanese cuisine and their sake inspired yadukai, rice, kombu, seaweed, yuzu, sea salt. And it's just this really umami explosion, but also this sort of like wild complexity as well, too. And it's just it's just not a flavor combination that I've really experienced before. And it's something that's so interesting. It just makes you stop and think like what what else is possible? And even more so, you see breweries like uh, Iowa's Peace Tree. They made uh the jizaki, which was all rice, sake yeast, no hops. And at that point, you ask yourself, I mean, is it beer? Is it not? And I think we're at this point right now where beer has sort of been completely unmoored from this idea of it just having to be four simple ingredients. So I mentioned beer is so culinarily driven that brewers, it can just be driven by the pursuit of sort of flavor, experience, emotional connection, they can really create whatever they want right now too. And the same ideas that we are taking, I think in American brewers has also been exported around the world. And we've really, American brewers for better or worse, have really been instrumental in sort of breaking the world out of its sort of um, lager, you know, lager hegemony. And now you're seeing fascinating brewing cultures pop up everywhere, especially in Japan, you're seeing tons of inspiration being taken from sort of American brewers. The IPA has been recontextualized over there, and now brewers are utilizing everything from like matcha and other ingredients, and yuzu and very native fruits really complement the hop aromas and flavors and create something that's just thrillingly new, but also speaks specifically to their home market too. And I mean, because we are, we're, we're in this moment right now where people are really feeling out and experimenting in a huge way too. But I think in the next five or 10 years, you can see people and ideas really settling down and these new ideas coalescing and taking root. So I think we're going really fast right now with beer. And I think after a little bit, we have to slow down a little bit and sit back. And I think then these brand new cultures or brand new, brand new ideas are going to become fascinating new traditions. And I really see that sake is going to be an important part of you know, where American beer is going to be going right now, too. And I mean, it's just, there's so much potential, the synergy between ingredients and the ideas, tradition, and lack thereof. It's just, I'm excited where it's going to go. And so, yeah, I think we're going to, so, I just kept on talking for a second. I did have this next slide. It says, we're going to drink beer, but it's not. And I was like, I was going to click the next slide, and I'm like, we're not drinking beer yet, so we got to tease you for another, like, 20 minutes, give or take before we go out there and drink beer. But you know, but really, I mean, this, the idea of all this, it just goes back to my curiosity that I have as a journalist covering the beverage industry. It's just, 
that beer is not one thing, that beer can be everything. And so that's what really excites me, that there's no shortage of stories to really chronicle. There's no shortage of stories to follow. And sake is going to be a really fascinating thread to see how it sort of weaves itself in American society. And you're going to see it happening. The Culinary Institute of America is going to be opening up a giant sake, produce, a sake production facility upstate New York. Uh, there was another smaller sake brewery someone reached out to me about. They're going to be starting up around downtown Brooklyn sometime soon. So this idea is really taking root. And it won't be a sort of like pure approximation of Japanese culture, but it's going to be something that's it's going to be inspired by and build on it in the best way that people can do possible. So cool. So we're not going to drink beer yet, but I think we're going to make that slide thing go up. So we won't tease you with that and do a little Q&A for a minute. Thank you so much for an amazing presentation. And we beautifully showed um, the collaboration or mutual inspiration, um, or inspiration, whatever you call, between uh, the beer and uh, sake. Yeah, yeah it's producers. really cl collaboration, inspiration. It's really about taking these ideas and making them your own, too. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be able to make approximate anything traditionally. And I mean, should you try? I mean, if that's your goal. But I, I think right now we're in an era of Really, flavor is just such a goal right now for so many consumers at this moment. I mean, we see it in our food and our Dorito, Loco, Taco Bell, whatever's and crazy ghost pepper experiences. And I think it's just we're in this flavor seeking moment right now. And I think, you know, beer, sake, everything kind of fits right into that, that moment we're having. Mm. It's interesting because people tend to say um, sake is rice wine, but it's yeah. not wine. Technically speaking, um, Wine doesn't need the conversion between uh, from starch to sugar. Yeah. Whereas sake and beer both go ha go through the same process of converting starch to sugar. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense there the collaboration between the two yeah. types of producers. I mean, if you ever go through, I mean, apples, grapes. I mean, if you go through an apple orchard in the fall and you smell that scent of like sweet rot in the air, I mean, that's that's fermentation happening, and the, you know, all the native yeasts on there are basically transforming it into. Alcohol, which is why sometimes you get epidemics of like really drunk geese and so on roaming around, because <laughs> literally they're just going, there's there's a brewery in Colorado uh, that basically had to like fix out the grain situation because the moose were coming there and the elk were coming there and eating all the grain, and then they made a beer called Stumbling Elk because the elk were getting really <laughs> drunk on the extra stuff. <laughs> right. Um, so the you know, whenever it comes to beer or sake make, making, there's a common denom denominator, which is uh, yeasts. Mm -hmm. So um, how important are yeasts and the yeast also in terms of, you know, adding flavors to what function does it provide to? Yeah, I think, I think yeast is something that never really gets overlooked, maybe because it's so small and so microscopic. When you, when you have beers... Oftentimes the things get really cherished are the hop flavor, especially right now. Hops have very expressive aromas and flavors, everything from lychee to watermelon to citrus. And these are sort of things that really, that really arrest you and really are like, wow, that smells amazing too. But hops are just kind of gilding the lily. It wouldn't be anything, beer would be, hops would be useless for not for something like what yeast does. If you think about beer's construction, beer, like malt and grains are sort of the building blocks provide the sugar for the yeast to kind of go out there afterward and really convert that into something amazing. I mean, without yeast, all you're drinking is like hoppy grain water, and it's just basically like boiling oatmeal and just like drinking the water from the oatmeal, and that's not fun at all. So what, what the yeast does is it really provides like a beer soul, its aroma, a lot of aroma, a lot of flavor complexity. And I mean, if you think about the natural world, yeast is all around us. I mean, you can make, there's, there's yeast lurking in your hair, there's yeast on fruit, there's yeast just like, I'm probably the microphone now. But I mean, what, what's really fascinating about it too is that there's just so much genetic complexity in there as well too that, and that yeast is so important. And I think if you get a great yeast strain, it can really sort of drive your company in a fantastic direction too. And I mean, creating memorable flavors, something that operates according to a schedule. And I mean, yeast, like a lot of us, just want to be happy. So they want to live within sort of like it's very specific temperature range. And it varies for each one. If you give yeast the right temperature range, the right ingredients, they're going to be really happy and give you what you want, which are these memorable flavors. But if you take yeast out of sort of their happy spot, they get really stressed out, like a lot of us. And then, you know, they start having all these off flavors too. So yeast is so important and paying attention to yeast and selecting the right yeast strains. And I think, and there's just so much potential out there to explore right there too. And what, what's really fascinating to me is there's a lot of um, amateur yeast hunters out there that are basically going into uh, 
going, getting flower, fields of flowers, apple orchards, and just like getting yeast strains. I mean, just because you get a yeast strain doesn't mean it's going to make good beer. So you have to figure it out too. But it's, it's super important if you get a great yeast strain, you can have something that's very distinct to your brewery that's something that's only your own. And because you can all buy the same malts, you can all buy the same hops. Most yeast strains are sold from giant yeast labs. But if you can get something that's really your own or develop its own cult, you can develop it gives you kind of a competitive advantage in a sense. Mm, interesting. Because like traditionally, uh, in Japan, to make sake, it mm. could be either native to the house, mm-hmm. that's yeast, like house flavor, or there's a, you know, there's association mm-hmm. who kind of um, develops the best types of yeast and then distribute nationally. So whatever you, you get, us, it's available best, most refined yeast available. Mm-hmm. But sounds like in this country, um, it's it's free. You can just use anything, experiment. Yeah, you can experiment with everything you want to. I think that's exciting, but also terrifying because yeast has to make good beer. I mean, you can experiment all you want, but the beer has got to be good at the end of the day. And I think I think that's a challenge. Like, is this yeast going to be, is it good for a gimmick's sake? I mean, Rogue Brewing had a beard beer, which was made with, you know, people's yeast from, yeast that was isolated from the brewer's beard. And I mean... Did it taste good? I mean, it was a good media stunt, but I mean, at the end of the day, the beer wasn't that sort of distinct. So just because you can brew a beer with a yeast doesn't mean you should. Mm. <laughs> um, the, another element uh, in making the flavors, I think uh, the souring, um, souring bacteria, it's like a lactic acid in the air? Or? Uh, yeah, lactobacillus. I mean, yeah, I, I think the interesting thing too is that in the same sense that most beer is fermented with a yeast strain, like a single yeast strain goes from start to finish, and there you go, there's the flavors. What happens with, you know, with uh, sake production, you have co-fermentations, so you have the koji and the yeast working together. So what a lot of American brewers are doing right now is kind of having their own spin on co-fermentation. They don't need koji to unlock the grain sugary potential, but they're utilizing things such as regular yeast strains mixed with something like uh, lactobacillus, which is souring bacteria. And that's the same stuff that, you know, turns milk into yogurt and sour cream and so on too, and provides that sort of like lactic tang. So you have this sort of, um, you get this profile from the yeast and you've also got this like nice like cleansing acidity from the lactobacillus and it creates like new flavor combinations. In the same sense, you see people utilizing wild yeast. And by wild yeast, I mean, it's a genus called Bredonomyces. And that the reason it's wild is most yeast strains, I, 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 like, I liken it to Pac-Man an awful lot. If you think of a Pac-Man board, it's got all the little pellets on there too. And most yeast like happily goes around and it's like, it's like, okay, I ate all the pellets. Like I feel pretty good about myself. Like I'm done. And it craps out and it's like, takes a nap and it stops working. Like Brandomyces would keep eating the pellets. Then it would start eating like the entire game board. Then it would start eating the console. It's basically a sort of like very, it's, it's a ravenous creature of what it does. And so a lot of people are frightened of using it because you put this in beer, can just it'll just throw everything haywire. But what Brandomyces does is it creates these sort of very, it creates, sometimes people liken it to flavors like, you know, barnyard or horse blanket, which is terrible because nobody's ever smelled a horse blanket in the last 10 years. But if you think about it, it's just like a nice rustic, earthy flavor profile, or it could be sort of like uh, like bright and citrusy with a tang of just like funky wildness to it. And that's because there's so much experimentation happening with this genus. There's more, there's two major yeast strains, ale and ale, ales, which could be everything from like stouts to IPAs and lager, which is like your pilsners and things such as that too. But there's more genetic variation in Brandomyces and both of those sort of categories combined together. And so people are really exploring it to see like what new directions that, you know, beer can be taken. And that's what I think yeast at its core has the ability to do is take beer into new directions. Mm, interesting. And uh, you showed us a couple examples of rice being used to make beer. Yeah. So what is the benefit of using rice? Yeah, there's a good benefit. I mean, rice is going to make something crisper, cleaner. It's going to have like a bit of more of a, maybe a lightness to it. So if you think, if you've ever had a, a double IPA, you know, sometimes like about 8%, so kind of heavy, kind of boozy, maybe a little bit too much malt sweetness. If you add something like rice in there, it'll create a more, it'll lighten up a little bit. It won't maybe sit so heavy on your palate too. And I mean, if you think, there's a lot of benefits to utilizing rice in something like a lot of the classic Japanese rice lagers. I mean, that crispness comes from, you know, crispness comes from rice. And so it's really important to have it in there. It's not going to have that same characteristic if you didn't have the rice in there. Mm. But I think, too, it's just sort of we had this moment where 
smaller brewers were trying to set themselves apart from bigger brewers, and so Rice became the boogeyman because Anheuser Busch uses Rice. Rice must be evil, and so because Anheuser Busch is evil, it's like this sort of like this argument, like if A therefore B therefore C, but it's not really the case, and it's like anything else. So nowadays you see people utilizing everything from rice, corn, oats, which have like like a smoothness and, and like a creamier mouthfeel to spelt and kamut and all these sort of like grains you see in your health food store aisle. And each one contributes unique flavor profiles together as well. Mm. So that brings <laughs> quite my question. So um, the reason we need koji to make sake yeah. is that the rice is milled down, so the surface mm -hmm. is going away, so that doesn't make any multi elements. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to add koji mm -hmm. as an enzyme, right? Yeah. So if you don't mill rice, you can make beer, like rice rice beer. That's a little bit beyond my beyond my scope of expertise. <laughs> I think that's a moment you say, but it's a different, it's like serialization. You have to go through a different process. Mm. There's a different way you can go about doing it, like heating it up, cooking it down in a sense too. Yeah. But rice can be very gelatinous as well. Mm. And so it can sometimes cause problems when used in beer production as well. Yeah. So you know, utilizing all rice can make for a very long brew day. Okay, yeah, because you, the way you described rice and beer, that taste sounds really tasty. So I yeah. It was 100% rice beer. Yeah, you know, too, but it's going to be super. I have not tried it because I've not been to Iowa this year, so. But I think, like, in that case, too, it was, sorry, my Tony Robbins headset was writing it up. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, too, it's like sometimes too much rice may make a really light body, too. And, I mean, there's a benefit to utilizing, like, barley and other things, too. And they add different bodies and viscosities to beer as well mm. and contribute the mouthfeel. Because without the other grains, you're just going to have a very thin mouthfeel and have something very watery. Mm, interesting. Okay. And uh, so um, you showed me a couple of different examples. But uh, why do you think sake producers are interested in making beer? Yeah, too. And I mean, I think why are sake producers interested in making beer? I think like anything else, too, I mean, they can now. And I mean, a lot of so much of what we've been seeing and anything else is the government allowing you to do something. I think once something becomes possible and there's a demand for it in the marketplace, and I mean, in that same sense, too, that, you know, Japan didn't really have much of, you know, Japan's beer traditions up until sort of that moment were very much rooted in sort of like so much of Asia. A lot of the, like the crisp lagers, which are great, you know, the very food-friendly beers, like a crisp lager really takes away the fatty richness of ramen or, you know, something like that. And so I, I think they're very useful within that context. But, I mean, there was so much more than that, too. And if you can explore, why not? And if you're already making – I think if you're already making sake, you understand – proper fermentation control, you understand how to be fastidious and have a clean brew house. And these are all sort of things that apply really well to sort of like what it means to be a, uh, what it means to be a brewer overall. Mm. And I mean, too, and if you've got the equipment, you've got extra space and you've got the ability, why not give something a go too? And I, I don't think the sake audience, I mean, I, I think the sake audience and the beer audience, I mean, there are different occasions for that too. You're not going to always... You know, we're, I think it gives, it gives your consumers a new reason to try a product that you have too. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see sort of um, breweries that make ciders as well and make other products or breweries that make spirits. Like in New York City, Interboro Brewing makes um, beer and they also make whiskey and they make other things too. And it's another way to kind of go about giving something to customers. It's sort of, I think, I think overall this is sort of this response to that. We used to have this moment, I think, when we created – there's this moment when you're making booze that you just kind of gave it to people and they're like, thank you so much. It is booze. I will enjoy it so much. And, but nowadays there's just like so much feedback loops. People are like, why is booze taste like this? I want my booze to taste like this and this and this. And I want this. And I want this experience. I want my kombucha, kombucha to get me drunk. And I want to have like a, you know, a green tea martini and they want that too. So these things are much more about consumers are responding to what they want right now too. And so it's, I think, incumbent upon producers to kind of give it to them as well. And if people are not, I mean, conjecturing, if people are not drinking one brewery sake, why not also try beer as well too? You understand the processes, give something else too. And in that sense with American producers too, it's another way of sort of, um, you know, look, if you're, if you're an IPA brewery making IPAs all day long, it gets pretty boring just doing the same thing day in, day out. So it's really all about staying sort of restlessly creative and trying new things all together. And I think it is. I mean, it's not just, I think, I think it's mentioning in the talk, but it's not just the, it's not just like that you want to make beer. It's like you want to ferment and see what's possible in this world too, to like turn, turn these humble ingredients into happy hour. Mm. Right. So do you think it's a, the, that's the same reason that um, 
the it's like a beer brewers getting into sake making. It's the same same thing, trying to new, do the new thing. Yeah, I think it's something new too. And I think what's happened is I think beer drinkers are very promiscuous and curious too. And I think, um, you know, and this is really, it's really hard on this creativity level because right now, you know, 10, 15 years ago, a brewery would make like four core beers year round, maybe a couple of seasonal specialties, like a dark beer for winter and like something lemony for summer. I don't know. And so, but nowadays, I mean, people are demanding new stuff every single week and it's really hard to be creative on that sort of timeline on that too, because creativity doesn't operate always according to production schedule. And so I think for people that maybe just sort of like burned out on just taking a double IPA and doing the same thing and just tweaking the hop bill, I think for sake fermentation and utilizing these things really offers you a new opportunity to really break out of what you know and really try something new altogether. And I think that's what's really important right now is always saying, you're not, if you're just making the same thing every day, you're not gonna survive very long in this modern beer world. It's just, we're, we're beyond that. I mean, so many flagship beers for a brewery have gone by the wayside. You don't, I mean, how often do you guys buy like a 12 pack of beer and drink the same thing like from start to finish? It's not people are buying beer by the ones or twos and at the bar people are trying 10 different things, mm -hmm. you know, trying little samples of this and that. It's really, there's just, I think there's so many things out there right now you want to try more. But, but it goes back to that, but the sake production at the breweries is just another, it's another way to kind of, you know, creativity, explore new angles. And then, but I, I don't see a lot of these breweries going to be putting the sake out in bottles at the moment too. I still think there's a lack of education in the American marketplace about what it is. And so you're seeing these products being served at brew pubs, small tasting rooms, where you can actually hand sell this product and really, you know, talk about it in a very intimate way and say, oh, this is this. And you think sake was wine? No, it's really just like beer and here are ways. And so, but that same sort of hand selling happened a long time ago in beer. It's like, you know, it's like this beer d doesn't taste funny. I mean, beer can taste like this. In that same sense, I think that sake is going to need a lot of hand selling. And I think, but I think American beer consumers are really primed to experiment and try new things. And that's why I think it's got possibilities. Mm, very interesting. So that you mentioned during the presentation, um, you know, Dabtil Sake, Top Bellamy, uh -huh. and uh, Brooklyn Cross, um, Brian Pollen, and the Bri uh, Brandon Don. They're like um, a little reluctant to make sake because it's such a national, traditional beverage of Japan. So, yeah. they, so there maybe there's a hesitation in getting into sake, but I think it's great that American people try to explore how to make a great sake. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's always the idea of like stepping on the toes of tradition. And, you know, I think you can honor tradition and tweak it too. And I just think that... You know, you can make a very traditional pilsner, you can make a very traditional lager, you can make very traditional things too, but you're always going to have your own twist on it a little bit as well too. I think, I think the way you can get, <laughs> the way everybody gets away with it on the labels is like sake inspired, sake style, or like, you know, Belgian beer style. So as long as you put that little modifier, it's sort of like your, your crutch that <laughs> <laughs> you're like, it's our, it's our homage to this. And they're not saying it's going to be something that's exactly like it. Because I do think these traditions are very important. And it's not saying it's going to replace it, but it's saying that, it's, it's like your own take on what tradition means and this is what, how you interpret tradition in the modern context. Mm. I think tradition, I think tradition in some sense is too. Tradition means a lack of, in some cases, can mean the lack of progress for some people too. And I think that's what, that's why I think goes back to American brewing that we didn't have any traditions, which is good and bad. But I mean, it just allows, it just like takes all the, you can do whatever you want. You just can be as unruly as you want and try whatever. And it's like, you're only, I think you're only beholden to yourself, I think. Mm, that's interesting because, you know, like you said during the presentation, like there are over 6,000 crappy breweries in America. And climbing, and yeah. It was the 2017 and the previous four years, there was half, so it doubled in four years. Yeah, I wrote, yeah, I think my first book came out in 2011 and I was super excited. I was like, there's like 1,700 breweries in America. It's crazy. And then now things have just accelerated in a huge way right now too. And I think... There's a lot of a lot of discussion, I think, about if there are too many breweries in America. But I mean, just like context-wise and numbers, if we talk about concentration, there were I think, if we had the same concentration per population around 1900 for a population now, we would need to make there, there's like the equivalent of 30,000 I think or 30,000 breweries at the turn of the 20th century in America. We only have 6,000 now, mm -hmm. and so what just says to me that. What's happening is that you're not going to be able to like be a national brewery and sell your beer far and wide anymore. I mean, 
it made sense to sell your beer five states away, 10 states away, you know, 20 years ago, and there wasn't a lot of competition. But now it's so many competitions, so much competition in your backyard that if you're going to survive, you're going to sell your beer out of your tap room, you're going to be smaller. It's not saying you're, you know, I think you can have an ambition to take over your town and your neighborhood, but not the world anymore. And I think you just have to recalibrate your expectations. Because mm. you know, we were talking a bit before about if there are more Japanese beers in America, and the answer is not so many. And I mean, part of that too is that, you know, I think 30 years ago, so much of how we learned to drink in America was all about imported beer. It was about the Belgian beers and the German lagers and the English ales. Not really. It was like it showed us it was more flavor out there than the Bud or the Coors Light or whatever we had down the road, the sports bar. It was like, like imported beer showed us what the possibilities were about. But, you know, beer is a perishable product, and putting something on a boat and shipping it halfway around the world is not really the best way to take care of it, too. And, I mean, you have no idea what journey that beer is taking to get to sort of, like, your, your store shelf. And, I mean, beer is never going to kill you. I mean, I mean, if you drink enough of it, it will, I guess. But <laughs> it depends. I mean, I guess. So <laughs> just put that caveat in there. But, I mean, beer is never going to go – beer is never going to have the pathogens in there that are just going to be like, oh, my God, I, I died. But what beer is is, like, beer is just not going to taste – Beer is not going to taste as good as a brewer intended it to. And every beer style has got different timelines. You know, IPAs, drink it fresh as possible. Pilsner's lagers can stand a bit more time. And then general rule of thumb, higher ABV equals you don't need to drink it as quickly as possible. But, I mean, you're not going to find what made this, like, crisp, delicate, beautiful rice lager in Japan that's going to be dulled by time and travel and transit. Mm. And you just never know, I mean, what, who, how the beer is handled. I mean, everybody always blames a brewer if the beer tastes bad, but I mean, it could be the stock boy or girl that put the beer in the windows and, you know, then the light hit the bottle and they create the, the, the skunking aspect, which is like a real thing. Like light hits hops and it creates the same aroma found in skunk spray. And so never buy a beer in a window, in a sunny window. Just that. But yeah, you just never know what's going to happen. There's so much variability. But I think if it's in your backyard, you can understand and have a much more intimate conversation with somebody about what the beer is and have a talk about that. We, and it goes back to instilling more confidence in the people too. So instead of just taking it and saying thank you, like I mentioned, it's like you, you're encouraged to ask questions. I think questions are important. Mm. Um, so we talked about 6,000 breweries here, but in Japan, I heard it's just around 400. Okay. Because the regulation... Just recently the change in 1994, uh, where uh, the government used to allow a uh, beer license for breweries producing over uh, 2 million liters yeah. a year, versus now the regulation is so much lower, so that's like 60,000 liters. Yeah. So that's why they exploded market, more craft beer breweries, but they are still small. So, so small. How my, my question is, how um, do you think American um, craft beer market can inspire them? To well, too, I think one of the big issues, like hamstringing the uh, Japanese beer market, is so I was talking about homebrew was legalized in, I think, 78 by Jimmy Carter in America, and that really made everything possible. You could brew up to 200 gallons a year in your backyard, your basement, wherever you wanted to. And, you know, those people that brewed enough beer, they eventually had a buddy like, your beer is really good, you should sell that. It's going to be awesome. And then they <laughs> did. But the thing is, in Japan, you're legally prohibited from brewing beer over 1%. So home brewing still has a veneer of illegality. I mean, who the heck's brewing a beer to 1%? Why would you go through the trouble of, like, brewing anything to brew, like, the weakest non-alcoholic beer on the market? So, I mean, and that's really been a big challenge, I think, too, because uh, these sort of, like, minor leagues and the farm team of what, of what brewing is and what beer can be are not, are not there. When I was doing... Uh, the Homebrew World book, I was like, I really wanted to talk to like a bunch of Japanese producers and really get this sort of idea, but nobody wanted to talk to me because they were really afraid of getting in trouble with the government. And I was like, no, I mean, I, I like, it's okay. It's going to be fine. Like, nope, not going to do it. And so in the end, the people that talked to me for the book were a group of, I think, American expats mm -hmm. that went over there and opened up a brewery. They're like, whatever, we did it. We're fine now. And so it's just this like illegality idea, really, I think, um, really stops people, too. And, I mean, if like, what you're told is illegal and it's wrong, I mean, you're not going to embrace it out in the open, too. And I think what makes homebrew so amazing in America, it's, like, it's all about sharing community and people together. And, you know, there's this – people are like, why do people still homebrew if there's all this beer available? Because home – I mean, it's sort of like saying, why do people still cook if there are restaurants? I mean, it's really about sort of exploring your own hobby and trying to do something new or maybe imitate something. We we, we don't just create for, to fill a void. We create for the sake of creation. 
And in this idea, I think, with, with beer, if, like, you're told your hobby is going to get you in trouble, and I mean, and, and there, are, there are cases, too. There's in Iceland as well for the, the Homebrew World book. I think it's like two point something percent, and one of the people I was going to interview for the book got busted for trying to sell his, got busted by a cop for trying to sell his stuff. And so it's like, it's like, so like which kind of put those, that thing back to you. So it's really about the laws. I think laws really mm. make it permissive and available. So yeah. I think that's it, too. But I think um, the other thing that was really important, I think a lot of uh, some American expats went to Japan and opened up breweries like Baird Brewing, and showed what was possible for the modern beer revolution, and really, you know, you know, it showed this course could be there. Mm, interesting. Okay, so we have five more minutes left, so maybe you can take some questions from I guess those. so. Whatever. I'll answer questions. No questions. No, no, no questions. Okay. You have this, Pat's got a question. I know Pat. Oh, my gosh. I know somebody. <laughs> can you say when you saw Dr. Wood's ruling that you were going to do it? No. Um, you can, probably, yes. I don't, have, I don't have the list in front of me about that right now, too. No, I don't have the list in front of me, so I don't have the list of what they're to. But I think some of the ones we're going to be trying today are, I think, some of the modern Japanese breweries that are out there are really going to be ones that you're going to try some beers tonight. They're like, brewed with, like, matcha. They're brewed with oysters and other sort of, like, very indigenous ingredients that really sort of showcase the broadening scope of kind of what's possible too. And I think that's what, I think overall, that's what's exciting right now too, that Japanese, that's not just imitating American hazy IPAs. It's like a lot of Japanese brewers are utilizing native ingredients, being yuzu and citrus and so on, like I was saying, to really create their own language. We're going to be trying Baird Brewing, which is uh, one of the ones I was just discussing out there too, which has really been instrumental to changing, I think, Japanese brewing traditions as well. And I just don't have the list in front of me, so. <laughs> we, I'll answer one. We go, why not? What? You don't have micro? I can repeat the question. We'll do that. What? Yeah, he was, he was asking a question about things, sort of like the co-branding. It's going to like be like, try this thing from a weird foreign place. I don't... I don't think it's like that too. I think like anything is going, anytime something is new, it's always going to be treated as a novelty, you know, at, at first too. But I think, you know, what becomes, once you get past novelty, I think you learn the story behind it as well. And it's going to be the, eye, it's going to be in the hands of the sellers really talk about it as well. You can make anything a gimmick if you, if you spin it the right way. And I mean, but I think it's really incumbent on producers too. And I don't really see this sort of, the people I've spoken with about for researching some of these stories I've written on this, you know, they're not just trying to create gimmicky stuff. They're really trying to, it's the pursuit of flavor, utilizing sort of sake and the traditions of that as a springboard, really carving out like new, new ideas. But I mean, you do run that sort of idea, but in the same sense too, I think by decontextualizing it from this sort of idea that, you know, can only be embraced in this traditional setting, it kind of frees it to be, to be utilized by other people in a different way too. So I, I see it in both ways too, and I think that's, I think people are turned up, I, I think people think of sake as like a food beverage, and not something to have on their own too. And so it's so interlinked with food that I think, you know, having tap rooms and so on, and these people, it's a way to sort of divorce it from this idea that sake just needs to be kind of eaten with dinner. Oh, I, I, you, I saw your hand. Yeah, he was asking about how if I think, you know, gimmicks versus traditions and so on too. I think, I don't... I guess gimmicks the wrong way of phrasing things too. I think people are utilizing sake as sort of a way to try new flavors out and experiment with that too. And that's something what I think that American brewers have always done. But there are also very traditional strains what American brewers are producing. Brooklyn Curra really takes pains to you know bring sort of um, the idea of sake to a local market and be able to discuss that in a very in a way. It's not it's not they're not saying this is as good as what you're going to get in Japan, but saying, like, you know, this is as good as, this is what we're making. This is what we love about this. These are the things. And it's just, they're entry points too. So I, th I think, and, you know, I just think American brewers have always liked mashing things up. And that's, and that's just the way that I see it's partly happening too. But you see, you know, you know, what, what's so weird about off-color brewing utilizing, like, traditional techniques, but also using wild yeast, like, suck, who says it just as one kind of yeast has to deliver this one kind of flavor? to create sake. So I think it's like, it's using, utilizing tradition, but also utilizing sort of, um, you know, sort of like modern, modern tech, the modern idea of taking things in new directions. I guess one more question we're gonna drink. Why not? They got, they were waving their hands really, really big in the back. Okay. Or like, so, um, within, with intention. Yeah, they're at, 
Yeah, she's asking about the idea of like how much water influences stuff, and I mean, a lot of the great historic beer styles originated because of the water profiles, like Vienna Lager because of Austria's water. Uh, you know, in Czech Republic, you could create the Pilsner because the water profile there as well, too. And so water has historically been super important. But, I mean, it's 2018, and you can basically strip your water, make it naked, and build it back up again if you want. I mean, it's important, but, I mean, it's not as sort of, you know, New York City doesn't really have to tweak their water so much just because it's so good for brewing beer. But, I mean, you can, if you have the right equipment, you can take your water down and build it back up and create whatever profile you want at this moment right now, too. I mean, it's modern science working, working to better do things as well. But, I mean, years ago it was really important about where you place the things, too. And, you know, the limestone filtered water of Kentucky and Tennessee to create bourbon and whiskey and so on. It was important, but, I mean, in the water... Having great water is key, but it's not a, a deal breaker anymore. I'm sorry to cut it off, but enjoy. Thank you very much for both of you for wonderful hey, and Q&A. And we have a reception upstairs, so please enjoy.